Welcome to Think Peace, the podcast for founders, creators, coaches, and curious minds building the future of online business. I'm your host, Sarah M. Chapel. It's time to think deeper. Welcome back to the Think Peace podcast. Sarah M. Chapel here. Um, we have a bit of an introspective episode for you today. I am wrestling with a couple questions that we can kind of work through together here and hopefully we'll arrive somewhere useful for you. Before I dive in, I did want to announce that the newsletter, the Think Peace newsletter, is going paid. I'm really thrilled to have finally followed through on my longtime dream of focusing on my writing and getting paid for it and continuing to serve you in a deeper way through the research, reporting, analysis, criticism, and kind of personal essays that have really shown on the newsletter in the past year that you guys have given me great feedback on that I know are being referenced and informing your work and those of you that work for employers, that they're informing your work for your employers. And I want to spend my time doing that. I am really thrilled to introduce that to you as kind of my primary scalable offer, if you will, moving forward. I'm still coaching and consulting. I will still be doing some teaching, though probably not at the scale that I was previously, just due to my own changing interests and my desire for intimacy. But the newsletter is going to become more of a space for us to connect for us to get to know each other, for you to get to know each other, um, the community here that has gathered around this work over the years, which is pretty cool. Can't believe there's so many of you. Thanks. <laughs> um, you can learn more about that at thinkpeace.fyi. Um, you can sign up for a subscription. It is truly by far the least expensive thing I've ever done in my business. Um, and I know for some of you who love the podcast and have benefited from this work throughout the years, that this will be a great way for you to support it directly. Um, and of course, to have the opportunity to actually have input on what I'm writing and <laughs> participate in that process more. Um, I'm also bringing a kind of coaching and advice column over there. Longtime listeners will remember when I used to do live coaching on social media in Facebook groups, remember those. And on Instagram, I'll be doing that as a monthly column for paid subscribers. So you'll be able to submit questions and get your own personal think piece with responses if you join us there. I want to say a quick extra special thank you to the people who subscribed right away. My 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 poor little ego really needed it. <laughs> it it's very, it's challenging to make such a big shift for me. I'm a little bit of a slow snail sometimes. I, I know I come off as quite fiery and I could be very impulsive, but when it comes to big decisions, it often takes me months, if not years. And it has meant a lot of me to get early support from so many of you. So thank you. Um, so you go to thinkpeace.fyi and subscribe there. There will be free issues as well. Um, so you can still subscribe even if it doesn't make sense for you to pay right now, or you're like, I have no idea if I want to pay or I can't afford it at this juncture. Um, you can definitely get free access to that for some of the issues that we'll be releasing. Um, so thank you for my little announcement and yeah, I'm super stoked. It's really exciting. That kind of brings me to the first question I have right now is I need to figure out what this podcast is for, right? What does it serve? I've been podcasting for so long in so many different ways that I don't know that I've ever really nailed down like my theory of podcasting, like why I do this. On the top level at this point, one of the reasons I do it to be candid is because there are so many listeners. I find this to be one of the best ways for me to reach people who already know me. I don't know that I'm convinced about podcasting as lead generation in a sense of finding new people, though I know a lot of you do refer and share people to this, and I am grateful. Thank you. But this is one of the ways where we get to speak really directly, or I speak to you. It's a little one, it's a little one way, which is why the newsletter will be fun, because you can comment and all of these things when you subscribe. But what is it for? I do think my best episodes have been this kind of mix of teaching moment plus introspection, right? You get the you get the, the Sarah Chapel experience, a, a level of kind of personality that's hard to put into more polished writing sometimes where I have a voice for sure, but you don't get to hear me try to figure out what the fuck I'm talking about or solve problems or loop back on myself in a way that you get here. You get to really understand how I arrive somewhere. And I think that's valuable. Um, but I don't really know what I'm doing here right now. 
And that's one of the things I just wanted to kind of open into the space. I think that that's probably something that you guys are familiar with. And again, when I think of what this podcast does and has been useful for, I think part of it is a, an element of mirroring. I often record something and then I hear from you guys that you needed to hear it, right? That kind of synchronicity, that that alignment, um, that you were dealing with something similar, that you heard me put voice to something that you hadn't quite known how to say. And I think that's valuable. It's not really strategic or practical tactical, but it's valuable. It's valuable to know we're not alone. It's valuable to hear someone who, uh, I don't know, you at least think enough of to listen to, thanks again, um, wrestle with maybe similar things, especially if we're at different stages. Maybe you're a little bit newer to your work or you are newer to your business than I am, or you're in a pivot or making a change. And to hear someone who's been doing this for a while have similar problems still may be useful to you. But I'm opening that as kind of a question for myself in my head. Why? Why do the podcast besides the fact that I have a feed with a bunch of subscribers, which is great, <laughs> but maintaining that can't be the only reason for doing it. It's not enough. You know, that is very much what I'm working on right now for myself is what is enough, both in terms of you know making money and production, but also in terms of what I value and when is doing something just because you're supposed to do it enough? And I'm finding increasingly for me, it is not, it is not enough. I am very bad at doing what I'm supposed to do. And when I try to force myself to do it, it causes, it frankly causes physical pain. I know I have a lot of neurodivergent listeners. Um, when I make myself do something that feels counter to my values or to what is authentic for me at the time, um, doesn't mean it's a bad thing. That's not what I mean at all, but it, it can be very hard for me. It hurts. Um, it causes immense anxiety. It causes physical pain. And you would think I would have learned by now that means not to do it, but it's hard to overcome the belief that you're supposed to do what you're supposed to do, right? <laughs> that you can live in a slightly different way. I am uh, rereading the book Wintering right now. Uh, it's a book by Catherine May, I believe. I apologize if I've got her name wrong. Um, I was reading it five minutes ago, and of course, I've already forgotten. I read that book a few years ago, and I didn't really get it. It was when it came out, it was very popular. A lot of people that I knew really loved it. It, it was, you know, hitting some kind of chord with people. And I read it, and I thought it was fine. Um, I thought it, I found it kind of boring, and I didn't, I did, I didn't get it. And I'm rereading it now, and I can see so clearly why. At the very beginning, Catherine is talking about getting sick. I'm not, no, no spoilers here. It's not really that kind of book. Uh, it's a nonfiction book about, about your life falling apart, essentially. <laughs> and she's getting sick. And she talks about, essentially, how she has to completely recreate a life Um around new values, right? How she keeps trying to kind of keep doing her life based on values that she doesn't have anymore. And I can see now why reading it the first time it was hard for me to absorb um, because I was in this place of dissonance, right? Where I was having an experience, but I refused to allow myself to acknowledge it. I've already talked about this at length in terms of my experience running the Holistic Business Academy and kind of pushing to be a startup founder and looking for a certain kind of growth and um, acknowledgement and success. Um, and trying to do that partially because it was there, right? I love I love a challenge and I think that's a good enough reason to do anything, but but not quite being able to figure out how to make that match with some of my values. And especially in terms of what I know I need just as a person um, in order to be well, in order to be healthy or as healthy as I can be. Um, and I'm reading this book now and I get it. This entire year I have been pulling off these parts of myself. Um, I have been looking at them and ultimately discarding basically everything, <laughs> especially when it comes to things like work and success and how I am perceived in the world. I think a lot of you go through this too. I think a lot of us do. And I've had so many conversations recently with very successful people who are in the same place. And I'll say again, I mean, this is not the first time uh, by any means. You know, a big 
moment for me was when I left my corporate job, when I got sober and I um, started freelancing and started my business. And that the first couple months after I left that job, I remember how free I felt. Um, I was super broke. I had no idea what I was going to do. I was scared, but I felt so free. I felt so clear about who I was. I remember working in my garden and uh, biking everywhere because I didn't want to, I couldn't really buy a Metro card and it was summer, spring, summer. So it was perfect for biking all around New York city and just how embodied I felt in that space of being someone in motion and at rest and not someone sitting at a desk all day. And that's part of what kind of shifted my trajectory. There's a lot more in there, of course, especially around getting sober and how that changes your identity and how you have to, um, rebuild your entire life. Essentially, um, you can't keep doing things the way you did and you lose friends and you lose jobs and you lose entire parts of yourself that you thought mattered. Um, but you can't keep them if you're going to be able to take care of yourself in a way that you've decided to. And going through that again now, almost not quite a decade later, but about eight years later, seven or yeah, eight years, um, has been really fascinating. And I find myself coming back to that time in my life again and again, the, the path to stopping drinking and using drugs, how bad it had to get. Fortunately, not so bad for me, but I bad for people I loved um, and bad enough for me, to be fair, to finally stop. And I've seen that this year where I keep kind of pushing myself to the brink before I will finally change something before I will finally shift it and almost relax into what I've wanted the entire time. And this sounds like kind of like a deeply emotional way to talk about like becoming a professional newsletter writer. I mean, you're not wrong. It's a little absurd. (laughs) I can hear myself being like, I have struggled so long to start a paid newsletter. It's like, okay, Sarah, (laughs) what? Um, But Something about it really challenged my identity. It challenged what I believed was work that I should be doing. It is directly challenging my beliefs about the quality of my work, um, about what it's worth. I joked a little bit in the announcement that I really have no problem at this point, you know, selling five figure coaching programs, like group programs. I'm okay with that. I quote consulting packages that are multiple five figures regularly. Um, I know the value that I bring in some of these spaces. I'm comfortable with it. I've been doing this for eight years. I have a kind of experience that is a little hard to find. It's a little niche. It's a little weird. (laughs) I'm very much a jack of all trades um, kind of person in that sense. But I know that when I find the right person and they need what I have, I know what value it brings. I'm not afraid of that but asking people to pay me to write. (laughs) And I've been a professional writer. I have freelanced since I was in my early twenties. I've um, done reported pieces. I've done a lot of like SEO E clickbaity kind of stuff. I've done a lot of small pieces over the years and never been paid a huge amount, but I've been paid. I'm not unaccustomed to that, but there is something about, you know, being a girl standing before you, asking you to give me $7 a month, that challenges me. It challenges me because as a strategist, I know that this is about the hardest business model I could move forward with. (laughs) I know this because I worked with people for years. I've known this because I can do the math over on um, my newsletter. There's a, a piece talking about the math of something like this that you can check out if you subscribe. And I know that it's hard. Um, it is, almost as easy to get 10 people to pay $10,000 as it is to get 10 people to pay $10 for something. It's a little bit of a lie, this assumption that because something's less expensive, more people will buy it. That's not true. And the newsletter model and the kind of monetization of content model is really challenging financially. There's a reason that I've spent a lot of years kind of complaining or bringing, trying to bring awareness to models like Patreon, like Substack, where you're 
really trading, you know, your creativity for these small amounts of money, this kind of tip jar economy that is fine, um, but is challenging. And the people I know who are successful at it are either doing a lot of extra work. I think Patreon in particular pushes people towards that because of the tiers and stuff. I, I continue to think that's like a particularly challenging ecosystem to be in. Um, or they're just not making very much money. And very much being, of course, a personal idea, but I know exactly how many people I need to be paid subscribers for my newsletter to be a full-time salary for me. It's a lot of people. It's a big number. I have far more than that in my audience, but I also know what conversion rates for these things look like. I have very, I, I, I know too much, you know, I, I'm not seduced by the, the messaging on how easy it is to, you know, monetize your audience. I know that's not true. <laughs> I have all the knowledge to tell me that this is a challenging idea. And at the same time, it's the only thing I want, not to monetize my audience, not to get you to pay for a newsletter, but to write, to think, to do slightly slower work than I have been doing for the past several years, slightly more reflective work. And it takes time. And that brings me to the next thing I want to talk about in just a second, which is schedule and time. I'm obsessed with time right now. I'm always obsessed with time, but really right now. So reading Wintering and kind of noticing why a couple of years ago I would have kind of revolted against it, this idea that slowing down was necessary, this idea that there were seasons when you were going to not be very good at the things that you're supposed to be good at, you know, to kind of watch her go through this concept of giving up her entire career um, and how much that resonates with me right now and these kinds of times of darkness. And, and as I was saying this, right, at least where I live in New York, we're heading into the dark time of year. In the um, witchcraft tradition I work in, from the end of October until the beginning of February is called the mound. It is the dark time. Um, there are certain activities that don't really happen in there. We're kind of suspended in the space between death and life in the dark. And it's a time of coming together. It's a time of um, survival, uh, very much in some of the ways that Catherine May talks about in her book. These kinds of, uh, she talks a lot of, uh, to people from the far north and her experiences going there. And I also just am finishing up the My Struggle uh, series by, all right, when I found out how he pronounced his name, I really was like, for an American, it's so, you're like, this makes no sense. I apologize. I'm going to say it. And everyone's always like, that's how his name is said. I've listened to him said it. Carl Uva Kanauskor. <laughs> I can't, um, but I'm on the last book of that, right? And a huge part of his series takes place up in the far north as well of Norway and in the dark. And this kind of seasonality of experience is already getting so much darker in New York. It's wild. Um, we've had so many gray days because it's been raining, but now it's getting dark at like five o'clock and the time will change and it'll shift a little bit. But you see the sense of just hunkering down, right? Of, of slowing down of slowing your metabolism, right, to survive. Uh, Catherine in May has this great scene um, about dormice um, in wintering and, you know, how they get so squishy with the brown fat that keeps them, you know, alive and how they just kind of curl up and they lower and lower and lower their temperature, um, talking about hibernation. And I feel that. I feel the desire to hibernate a little bit in my work. And writing is such a great way to do that. Writing, even if you're a fast writer like I am, still takes time. You can't really skip it. I guess you can if you use an AI bot or something. Um, but if you're doing the writing, you can't really skip the time. It's not It's not something that can be done. It has to take, it takes time. It's not, in that sense, scalable work. I can't do it once and sell it over and over again. Um I mean, writing a book, yes, but not a newsletter, not something that's ongoing. So I think about the sense of time, right, and schedule. I think about that right now because as I'm recording this, one of the funny things about having a biweekly podcast is that time is a little funny. I record this usually about a week before it comes out, sometimes a little bit more, and that means there's this lapse. When I recorded the last podcast, um, Hamas had not um, attacked Israel, um, and now I'm recording this and 1,400 people in Israel were killed. And Israel has started a retaliatory war against Palestine that I believe has killed 
4,000 so far, and according to the UN, displaced a million people. Uh, it's a humanitarian crisis. Um, it is very sad and very scary, and people feel very angry and very powerless. And I see the way that time plays out in these moments. I'm not very active on social media anymore for a wide variety of reasons. But I, I do look a little bit during these these moments to try to see. I'm trying to find the news, right? I'm trying to understand what's going on. I know that we don't always get accurate news, um, unfortunately, in mainstream media. I also know, and we are seeing a really remarkable amount of disinformation in social media, especially on Twitter, X, whatever. Things are happening very quickly. It's very easy to make bold claims and then have to retract them. And we see a lot of very, very horrific things happening in terms of how people are interacting and talking to each other. Anger and frustration and impotence uh, leading to a certain kind of lashing out. And I think about that in terms of time because there's something really interesting that happens in these moments of crises online which is that everyone gets mad at their colleagues, at their peers, at people who are essentially at the same social status, same economic class as them, for not doing what they want them to do. There's this kind of sideways punching, punching down thing. And it makes sense, right? You know, sitting here in America, we are going to fund this war. I don't get a say in that. You're an American. You don't either. Your tax dollars are going to go to this war. Janet Yellen made it very clear. We can afford two wars. And I was like, of course we can. War is profitable. War is good for business. And actually, by the time this comes out, I will have written a piece about that in Silicon Valley um, over on ThinkPeace. So you can go subscribe there and read that. Uh, war is good for business, for big business. It's good for American industry. Um, we like war, actually, financially. There's also some really interesting things about that in Shock Doctrine um, by uh, Naomi Klein. If you haven't read that, she kind of shows the spread of capitalism throughout the world kind of as these post-war shocks have given um, the United States in particular the opportunity to completely change social structures and economies. And... Well, I don't think that's anyone's immediate thought when it comes to Israel and Palestine. It is something that I think is relevant here, for sure. And I see this sense of time where people want other people to suspend the time of their lives, right? You see these kinds of things um, like, how can you post about anything else right now? Now is not the time for X. Um, you know, the, the urgency is so great, which it is, but it's ignoring this other kind of element of time, right? Which is that I really believe that folks who continue to post, uh, for example, um, pictures of clothes, right? I follow a lot of fashion influencers, not a lot, but some, uh, I used to work in fashion, still really love the art and, uh, of styling and things like that. And a lot of them, of course, are still posting pictures of clothes. It's very easy to say, you shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> Very easy, <laughs> right? Who needs to see pictures of another picture of the $990 Margella Tabby Mary Janes right now? Uh, side note, those shoes are great, but I cannot believe how many people I see in New York City who own them. And I'm like, all right, I do not make as much money as I think I do by any means because I cannot buy those shoes. And even that sounds a little frivolous. I'm like, oh, I'm talking about shoes. That's frivolous. These people only make their money if they post, right? They do not have jobs. <laughs> they do not have careers outside of their own businesses. Um, when I see people getting mad, I, everyone's like, oh, I'm yeah, yeah. not everyone. But you see these kinds of things of, you know, often other sm small business owners sniping at other small business owners for, you know, posting as if it's normal. We saw this very much at the beginning of COVID. We saw this after George Floyd was murdered. Um, we saw this at the beginning of the war in Ukraine. And of course, we can be even more specific, right? There, I mean, or not more specific, but even more recent. We've had several tragedies, horrific um, earthquakes in Morocco, Afghanistan, recently, um, within the past you know month or two, right? It, there's always something horrific happening, and 
there's this desire to kind of lash out at people for not behaving the way you want them to. And I get it. It's so much easier. It's so much easier to get mad at someone for promoting their course right now. Like it's so easy. How dare you? You know, I've talked to a lot of people. I don't pretend to know the hearts of everyone. <laughs> that would be foolish. I've talked to a lot of people. I don't know a lot of people who want to be doing that. I don't know a lot of people for whom selling something in the middle of like a horrific international crisis is like what they want to be doing. They may love their work. They may want to do their work, but I don't know a lot of people who are like, yes, I want to spend my time posting about my class on social media while people are dying. Like that's no one sitting around saying that. We come back to this idea of time. And the reason I, I kind of refer to this as this kind of weird interclass warfare, not literal warfare, of course, in this context, I want to be careful with my words, but um, interclass um, squabble is because people are doing that because they have to. And this is, when we talk about time, one of the things that's so interesting is not only just the acceleration of time that happens in social media and how quickly things change and how quickly tides turn and, um, and anger and fear are stoked into a rage and a, a need to release the valve somehow. But it's also that we are systemically robbed of time to reflect and grieve. If you run your own business, you may not be able to afford to stop. And I remember at the beginning of COVID, you know, and I, again, a lot of people tell me a lot of things. I'm a confidant for a lot of people. I never, I never rehash specific stories to be very clear. I'm always mixing and matching and changing them around. I take my, my role as a holder of people's stories and concerns and fears very seriously. But I remember at the beginning of COVID, um, folks in small business online space posting and saying that they thought it was wrong for people to sell right now. People were dying. And I would see people do that who had recently also shared about making large amounts of money, for example, right? Who had had big launches and had shared about their success, which is fine. It's very easy to get mad at people for continuing to be, quote, business as usual if you can afford to financially. Now, is this the most important thing that's happening right now? No, not at all. But as it comes through the lens of this podcast, my work, I mean, I'm, these are the things that kind of make sense for me to speak on, right? I'm not an expert in, uh, you know, the Israel-Palestine conflict, even though it's something I've been studying since I was in high school. Um, I'm not you know, able to speak on that though with any level of authority um, other than to share my sadness and my, you know, my hope for, for freedom for the people of Palestine, my hope for grief and safety for people in the Jewish communities around the world who are so scared right now. And the way that we treat each other online though, that, <laughs> that is something I can talk about a little bit. So when we're in these moments of change where time dilates and it gets so narrow, remembering that we actually don't have as much choice as we think can be really powerful when it comes to how we interact with each other. Remembering that very few people, I truly believe this, maybe it's a little naive, but very few people are purposefully cruel. There's often belief systems that encourage a certain kind of cruelty. There are value systems, there's indoctrination of beliefs that can result in that. But when I see somebody promoting a course during a war, I don't think they're trying to be cruel. I don't think they're trying to uh, say that what's happening doesn't matter. I think they probably need to pay rent this month. There is a space here to recognize that not everybody has time. Not everyone has time. And instead of getting mad or judging individuals who respond to things in different ways, we can recognize the overarching structure which prevents us from having the time to grieve, which is specifically designed to keep us from engaging in our civic matters, right? Only certain people can afford to protest. Only certain people can risk being arrested. Only certain people can say certain things online. 
only certain people can afford to not work for weeks on end because there's an international crisis. There's a sense that time is something we do not actually have control over, even if we work for ourselves. This is one of the things I often hear, right? When you work for yourself, I want to control my time. I want to own my own time. Well, and I guess you do, right? You get paid for your directly for your time. If you have your own business, nobody is profiting off of your time except for you. Um, except you don't have a lot of choice about whether or not you work, most likely. Some people do, right? Some of you either have living situations where you your expenses are very, very low, or you have a partner who has a job that means that you don't need to make maybe as much as some others, or I mean, I've seen so many different arrangements over the years, or you have money of your own, right? Fine. But the people who are still out there kind of hustling at this moment are people who need to make money. I mean, to be honest, like I'm one of them. I don't have like, I was like, I just shut, I just shut down my product. Like, <laughs> I'm trying to be very conscious of how I'm promoting right now. And I do have the flexibility to not have to be like hammering it over the head that I would like you to join my newsletter, but I wouldn't really love you to subscribe to my newsletter. Um, but that is a, is a short-term privilege and not a long-term one for me. And I think about that when we think about time. And how ultimately, right, this is one of those those kind of truisms of living under capitalism, of living in a moment like this, which is that you can't actually afford to take time to be a human, right? To experience these things so fully. So with that, I'm going to start to conclude by talking about how we can work with our time now. So the first thing is this. I uh, you know, I know people just some of you will disagree with me on this and that's fine. I'd also just like to continue to keep that door open especially right now. Um we do not all need to agree on everything in order to respect each other, in order to learn from each other, in order to be colleagues and even friends. I have friends who have very different opinions than me on Israel-Palestine, for example, and that's okay. If we actually respect each other's humanity, <laughs> if we actually think that um, we're allowed to have opinions, it's, it's okay. And I know it's hard. We're, the divisiveness that social media encourages makes it very hard to recognize, to have the kind of nuance that often comes from these conversations in person, for example, right, or with your loved ones. I think there's two pieces here when it comes to time. You know, I'm kind of not very into productivity culture in the sense of trying to get more done. But I do think in moments like this, whether it's your own personal wintering, whether you, like me, have been through a process of just immense change. And I know a lot of you have. I, I talk to a lot of you. <laughs> I've heard from a lot of you. I know a lot of you have been in this recently. I do think that it's helpful to create some frame for our time, some routine. I'm feeling a craving for that. Part of it's because I traveled so much for the past couple months and I'm finally kind of rooting back at home. Part of it is because with the change in my work, I have a very different schedule than I've had for the past four years. It's, it's really quite odd. Um, I'm the kind of person who having anything on my calendar kind of creates a low level anxiety. Um, I get a little nervous about it. I, I have to kind of prepare for it mentally. Um, this is not an unknown thing. I think in particular with ADHD that having something on the calendar, even if it's like hours away can be a bit of a, it kind of creates an open loop in my brain, which is one of the reasons I continue to try to stack calls. Cause then I just don't do anything else that day, but I don't really have as many as I used to, um, because I'm not running all these programs right now. So I'm feeling that call for schedule, for 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 the a, a bit of structure. What that looks like for you is going to be different, right? I think right now is a really great moment to look at your structure around social media, for example. Uh, if you, like me, want to stay informed, but also know that you need to manage your nervous system. Um, and I know right now, one of those moments, people, it's very easy to say that your personal nervous system doesn't matter. Um... But to some extent, that's all we got, right? It's okay, I think, to have some inkling of self-preservation in times of crisis. Um, figuring out when you're going to access that and when, right? What you want to do with that specifically. 
For me, what I'm continuing to struggle with is not getting on social media and reading the news first thing in the morning. I am a bit of a news, a little bit of a news addict. Um, I read a lot of news. I, I would love to read a little bit less. So I'm trying to get back into this idea of a morning routine of some kind. I think these have become such a thing of like, I don't know, you get a little bit of an eye roll, but you know, how do you want to start your day? For me, it's reading, coffee, petting the dog, going for a walk, right? I'm a little bit less interested in the timing of those things. Um, and I think if you can be more flexible on that, it's nice. Less like I have to get up at 5.30 and do this. I personally find that my body is having a really hard time. I've been having a little bit of a health issue again. Um, and I just need to wake up when I wake up, right? Sometimes that's six, sometimes that's eight. So I'm giving myself that space and I can I can do that. And if you can, I encourage you to do that as well, but it still means we have that morning thing. What do we want to do to kind of create that awakening space? And then figuring out what your one thing is to do. What is the one thing you need to do today? I'm a list person. I have running lists. I use ClickUp. I have lots of notes. I have lots of little bits of paper everywhere with stuff on them. And I try to be really clear on what the one thing is I need to do every day. Today it's recorded this podcast. I have other things to do, but it's that. And then I think the final thing, again, especially for those of us that are working for ourselves, is what do we do when we're done with work? I was working on a newsletter yesterday. I worked for a couple hours writing and researching, and it's not done. So I was like, oh, no, I need to keep pushing. And I just kept trying to make myself work on it the rest of the day. I'm reading stuff that's not particularly challenging, but it's nonfiction. It's, it's information. It's stuff I'm trying to analyze. I'm not just reading it for pleasure. I'm not just reading news articles, for example. Um, I'm not sure that news articles are pleasure, but you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm not reading them recreationally. Um, I kept trying to force myself to do it instead of just letting myself be like, I'm done. I've done, I've worked for several hours. I don't have any more in, I can't do more today. Especially as I said right now, I'm just having some energy level issues and some other things. What are you going to do when you're done with work? For me, it's often very good to have a household task. Uh, some laundry, for example, cleaning something, cooking something. I don't particularly like cooking, but it can be a really good force stop, especially if I have to cook dinner for the, for my husband and I, um, he's the better cook. He usually cooks, but I have a more flexible schedule right now. So I'm doing more of the cooking. I'm doing okay. I think he keeps eating the food. So it's really unfortunate. He's such a better cook than I am, but it forces me to stop, right? Because I need to stop and actually make the meal. Some of you have children, right? You have these kind of like very natural forcing four stop points. Kid comes home from school. Kid needs something. Um, one of the ones I always come back to that's so simple, but it's like the dog has to go out, right? It doesn't matter how tired I am. It doesn't matter how sick I feel. It doesn't matter how terrified I am. It doesn't matter how overwhelmed I am. It doesn't matter how many different news pieces I read to try to figure out what's going on in Gaza. Like the dog has to go out. And as these things can feel kind of flippant in these moments, they are also the reality of our lives. The dog has to go out. The kids have to eat. You have to eat. So we have to work, probably, right? That's kind of part of the thesis of this. Like, we have to work. We don't get to choose not to work, um, most of us. If you're listening to this, you probably have to work. I think that's a fair statement I can probably make or do some kind of work. And that the level of work that is required, the fact that that doesn't give us room for pause often or the kind of space that we really maybe wish we had, um, especially in terms of how we present online and the content creation and the sales and all these things, right? That if we don't get that space and we do have to work, then now as, as the darkness descends and the world continues to be a place of, of horror at times, that has always been true, and it's not going to stop anytime soon, I don't think, unfortunately. And we can hope for and work towards it. We do need to figure out the balance. We do need to figure out the time and the space to do what is required to survive. And to do what is required to witness these moments, to do what is required to feel them, if you're anything like me, that is important to feel them and to know that you still have to wake up tomorrow and do it again. And in fact, you're lucky to get to wake up tomorrow, right? 
I mean, that's ultimately the thing. We spend so much time yelling at each other for how we do certain things online or not saying the right thing or being hurt. It is so hard to have to continue not be able to pause and bear witness and feel it. I know. So I hope for you and for me. The darkening days of the slowing down of time that can come as we head into the north, into the dark. And give you the space to feel and to grieve and into the midst of it all. Feel grateful that you woke up today. Thanks for, uh, for listening. Sorry, I kind of broke down there. I hope you are well. I hope you are cared for. And I hope that you feel some ease and rest, even in these dark times. I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to Think Peace. You can read the newsletter, join the community, and learn how to work with me at thinkpeace.fyi. I'll see you next time.